Good evening. Good evening. How is everyone tonight? Great. Excellent. Um, so welcome to all of you for our 2019 Biotech 201 session on the secrets of the human microbiome. Welcome also to our audience that's watching us online uh, from across the state, actually from across several states, and also the 50 educators from across Alabama that are watching this uh, broadcast for professional development. We're really glad to have you and thank you for spending time with us. So my name is Neil Lamb. I'm your host for our Biotech 201 series. Um, it is a treat to see you. I always love the first Tuesday night in February. It's a little bit like um, a homecoming or like an alumni reunion gathering. It's great to see you. You are the fortunate ones that within the first 15 minutes um, typed quickly and got into the room. Um, those of you that are watching online, my apologies that you were not within the first 15 minutes, uh, and, but we're going to have a great, a great time together. I want to make sure that everybody uh, got the handouts when you first came in. Um, for those of you that are here in the building, there are two sets of handouts. Those of you that are watching online, the link to your handouts, everything is condensed into one specific uh, PDF. We have a lot of ground to cover uh, tonight and for the next four weeks. We're gonna work to find time for questions. We're gonna um, give you a break so you'll have those fantastic cookies or whatever you might have at home in the pantry that you're gonna hop up and, uh, and grab. So here's what we're gonna cover for the next uh, four weeks. We're gonna talk about the human microbiome. Just out of curiosity, we first did the human microbiome five years ago in 2014. How many of you in this room were in that session? Okay, fantastic, a good group. We're gonna talk about some things that are gonna be familiar and a whole lot of stuff that is completely different and has changed since then. So here are the things that we're gonna cover. Tonight we're gonna talk about what the microbiome is and how it's formed. Next week we're gonna talk about specifically the gut microbiome, the bacteria that live in your digestive system and the relationships or the associations between altered microbes in your gut and obesity and type 2 diabetes and inflammatory disorders. The week after that, we're gonna talk about autoimmune disorders like type 1 diabetes and other autoimmune disorders. And we're gonna talk about this relationship between what's called the gut-brain axis, which is more and more we're learning that bacteria in your digestive system actually influence the way that you think and feel and behave. Comes back to that concept of a gut feeling. There's actually a lot of truth <laughs> to that. Uh, we're also going to talk about some interesting new data coming out about relationships between altered gut bacteria and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And then the last week we're going to talk about how do we manipulate our microbiome. Can we manipulate our microbiome? What's the impact of things like antibiotics and probiotics and prebiotics? And should you be eating that uh, probiotic spiked uh, yogurt or drinking um, that homemade kombucha. We're going to talk a little bit about some of those pieces as well. We will probably generate a lot of controversy during the next four weeks, um, and I am completely comfortable with that. Uh, the world of science is rarely cut and dried, and this equates to that. And we're going to definitely dig into many of those examples as we work through the next four weeks. So let me give you a few just upfront thoughts. These are not in your handouts, these slides. I just want to lay some groundwork for where we're going and set some ground rules. We have so much information that we could cover. And tonight and the next three weeks are going to be speed skates. We are going to literally move rapidly through this. I'm going to point out some key landmarks as the wind blows through our hair and then we're moving on. So if you would really like for us to stop and cut a hole and drop a line and dig deep into it, this is not that class. Um, <laughs> I will give you plenty of science papers that you can read if you want to do that, but we are unfortunately not going to be able to spend that level of detail. Here's an example. When I first gave this in 2014, in February of 2014, in the 44 years before we gave this first talk, 6,200 science papers had been published about the microbiome. 
That's a significant amount, don't get me wrong, but 44 years, 6,200 papers. In the last five years, 15,000 papers on the human microbiome. The field has exploded, and that is fantastic, but it also means there is so much information out there, and as you'll see, much of it is unfortunately still contradictory. And we'll dig into why that's contradictory and some ways that we can decipher through that. So this, I think, you do have in your handouts. And it refers to my fantastic prop over here. Each year, we have some sort of prop. Um, this year, I have this giant pyramid of boxes. And this is a specific reminder to us of the way that science and scientific research is done, especially in the field of microbiome studies. So let me take a little bit of time to walk through this. This will be here every week, and we're going to refer back to it. Often the initial level of research, the, the first discovery, is an association. So a researcher looks at a population of individuals with a certain trait or a certain disease or a certain characteristic and compares some part of their microbiome. Maybe it is the skin microbiome, maybe it's their gut microbiome, maybe it's their oral, their mouth microbiome, and compares the bacteria that are present at that site between the group with the disease or the trait and the group without. And they may find there is something different and they will publish that. That is an association. So there is a different level of bifidobacteria in the gut of infants that are nursed versus infants that are formula fed. That's an association. That is all that means. We have found some sort of correlation between the two. That does not mean A causes B. The press that we write around that often confuses that. So you'll often see individuals that have this disorder have this gut change, and this is what we think we ought to do about it. Most of those 15,000 papers live in this box. It's a big box. There's a lot of that box. But there's a long way between this box and the therapy box at the very top, which is we can actually do something to change that. The next box is actually, I think, one of the most critical boxes, and that's the box of replication. That says, I've looked at this in multiple populations, and I have seen the same thing over and over and over. As you'll see as we move through this, there are so many different ways that we could study the microbiome, so many different ways we could do tests, that it is very easy to get completely conflicting data, even from the exact same set of populations. So has the data, has the association been confirmed in multiple other populations? Then have we actually made a functional connection between why we see this difference and logically how that relates to a disease? So have we determined that this set of bacteria uh, specifically carry out these functions and lead to the production of these proteins or these small molecules that we know triggers this kind of impact in this sort of cell type. So that is not, I see a higher amount of this bacteria, that is, here's the path of plausibility through biology that can take me from how that might be possible. That doesn't mean it's definite, but I've now got some scientific understanding of the biology behind that. Next, have I actually been able to identify some sort of change in another organism, in a model system? That might be in cells, in a cell, set of cells in a dish. That might be in fruit flies. Often, much of this work is actually done in mice. So these are called germ-free mice. We'll dig into that more next week. But have I actually shown in a living system that when I make this change, when I mimic this association, I actually see this disorder, and have I also shown that if I alter that by giving them different bacteria, probiotics, or by changing their diet, or by changing their environment, that I see some modification of the symptoms. This is the first time we're really ready to talk about potential intervention. What can I do about it? I've seen the association, 
I've mimicked it, I've replicated it in multiple populations, I understand biologically how I can get there, now I've actually shown the first steps towards, yep, this happens in other animals, and I can begin to see how if I make this change, I might think about lessening symptoms. Clinical trials is the first time this shows up in humans. This is the first time we actually say, all right, well, what happens if I give this population of different bacteria or this prebiotic? And there are multiple levels of clinical trials. Initially, just starting out, is it even safe? Let's not even worry about if it does what we hope it does from here. Is it even safe in humans? Because often what works in mice does not work at all in humans. We have so many drugs that, that treat, almost cure, Alzheimer's in mice, none of them have made it through clinical, very few of them have made it through clinical trials. So this is a place where it really narrows down. And then if we've made it all the way through and we have a lot of luck, at the very top is therapy. So this is something that in a human population, if you do this, this is the intervention. And again, that doesn't guarantee that it works in everybody. It may only work in a subset of individuals. All right, why did I just spend so much time talking you through these boxes? Because most of what we talk about in the microbiome is still down here. That's where the field is right now. Because we haven't yet fully figured out how to standardize the specific tests, so every researcher is running the exact same test prepared in the exact same way. So we don't even have a good handle on yes or no right now. But there are a whole bunch of groups that are happy to take this data and mix up a batch of bacteria in their kitchen and sell it to you as a treatment. <laughs> you think I'm joking? No. So this is the critical piece. I don't want that to frustrate you. I don't want that to, why can't we get further and faster? We will in five years from now when we do this again, we're going to find a whole lot more up here. But I just want to make sure you walk out of here each week realizing that most of what we talk about is down here. And don't walk out and say, oh, well, I'm going to go find, my, find me some bifidobacterium and I'm going to take it. And that is certainly the case when we start talking about fecal microbiome transplants. <laughs> there are cases where the data is here or the data is here, even a few where the data is up at the top, and I'll tell you that. So you'll get a sense of where we are on this chart. But this is, I think, the most important foundational piece that I can put in front of our conversation about the, micro about the microbiome. And hopefully when you see things that come across in the press about the microbiome, read closely to see where it lands in this arena. The work that came out about a week and a half ago about um, specific gingivitis bacteria that are associated with Alzheimer's in mice lives right about in here. So it's significantly high on the list. There's a fair amount of data behind it. But brushing your teeth or not brushing your teeth, flossing or not flossing, is not the way to think about how you prevent or how you increase your risk of Alzheimer's, regardless of what you might have read on the internet. So. This is a really, really key piece for us that I want to make sure you recognize. And that's actually true for how much of science is done. It seems like it moves at a snail's pace, but that is the body of evidence required to get us to human therapy. All right, so I told you we spend a whole lot of time down here, and that's because of some of the things that are on the screen behind me. There are multiple different ways that you can measure the bacteria on your skin or in your mouth or in your gut. For example, if I wanted to measure your gut bacteria, there are five different things that I could conceivably look at. Five. And right now they don't all give us the same answer. So just imagine five different ways I can sample your gut bacteria all done at different time points, all prepared in different ways, all using different chemicals. And then when we actually look at the genetics, the DNA of those bacteria, that is a huge puzzle for computer scientists to have to filter through all of the information and say, this is important and this is not. 
And the filtering system that we use, depending on how you set those controls, you may let too many things through and you have a lot of false associations, or you may be too restrictive and you miss the things that are actually really critical. So again, I know this sounds like a lot of doom and gloom. That's not what I mean to say. I just want you to look really, really critically and understand where we are and where we aren't. This is another really important point. <laughs> we all make decisions in our life based on our circumstances and our surroundings and lots of things that are within our control and are not and are outside of our control. And in hindsight, sometimes we might make those decisions differently given information that we know today. But I don't think anybody walks into a decision and says, I'm going to intentionally make the stupidest, wrongest decision that I can. As we start talking about the microbiome and about early life indicators and about diet and about other things that the data seem to suggest modify our microbiome, I want to be really careful that you don't hear me passing judgment on decisions that people have made when we didn't have that information. And then I want you to not go out of here and pass judgment on the people around you because of the decisions that they've made. It will be too easy, because this is so cool, as you tell other people about what you're learning, it's really easy to just slip right on over and say, well, you know, you did that, and if you hadn't done that, and I told you you shouldn't have done that, and this is what you've really messed up your microbiome, and na 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 and Dr. Lamb said that was true. This is a guilt free space for the next four Tuesday nights. So if you brought someone with you and you're tempted to look at them and say, I told you, you shouldn't have done that. You need to wait till you get in the parking lot. <laughs> but preferably you don't do that at all. But so the next, this next slide goes along with it. Be really careful that you aren't pointing fingers and pointing blame at people around us. Really, really careful. Moms, mothers-in-laws, I am talking to you. <laughs> so he said, wait a minute. All right, a couple other pieces. Um, we are going to have some conversations tonight and over the next few weeks that are topics that you might find squeamish or that you might generally not talk about in polite company. I cannot talk about our microbiome without these conversations. If you are wondering what I'm talking about, you can flip about six pages ahead in your handouts and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So, Tonight has some components that are PG-13. And we're going to take our break right before we get there. <laughs> so if you look through the slides, the handouts, and you see some things that you don't really think you want to sit in this room and listen to, then at the break, you are welcome to step out, grab a cookie, and head to your car and then watch the second half sometime this week on our YouTube channel in the privacy of your own home. No judgment from me. This is a science session, and I am going to use appropriate words for the terms that we are talking about. I will do us no favors if I use cutesy language and if I use words that imply something else. We are all here because we want to learn and we want to understand. But I also recognize if some of this makes you a little uncomfortable, by all means, at the break, step on out. I'm, that, that does not hurt my feelings. I just want you to be forewarned. After this week, most of what we're going to talk about is poop. So <laughs> that gets a lot easier to talk about. I also want to have this really important piece. For much of the last 100, 125 years, our understanding of bacteria 
has been as things that cause death and disease that must be eradicated at all costs. So this is an image from, uh, I think it's a 14th century uh, um, fresco um, in Italy, The Triumph of Death. And you see death, a skeleton, on an emaciated horse riding in and just indiscriminately killing rich and poor, um, young and old. These kind of images are really popular from the Middle Ages as things like the Black Death, the bubonic plague, swept through populations. But we, throughout the last 150 years, have continued that set of language. We talk about germ warfare. We talk about the battle to destroy the bacteria that are out, or the viruses that are out to get us. And yes, there are certainly bacteria and viruses in our world and fungi in our world that are dangerous and that we need to control. But the vast majority of the bacteria that live in and on your body are either neutral or are your friends. And if we can begin to think about that in a different way, and think about the way we think about the world around us and our environment and our use or overuse of antibacterial, I think we might see that we are in a better place if we are a little more comfortable living in a world of bacteria. As you sit here right now, for the hour that you will be sitting here, well, the hour and a half that you will be sitting here, for each hour that you are sitting here or that you are sitting at home, 37 million bacteria are coming off of your body and into the environment. And the person sitting next to you is doing the exact same thing. So there's a great microbial soup just in the air around us. Now you're all going to leave at the break. Um, 37 million. So this concept of we've got to be super clean and antibacterial as we get into next week and the week after, it's probably doing us no favors, and in fact, it's likely harming us. So I want us to try to step away from destruction of bacteria at all costs and come to a healthier balance with the microbes in the world around us. All microbes are not threats. In fact, over the next several weeks, we're gonna talk about these key features that your bacteria provide that you yourself, your human cells, cannot do on their own. You cannot do these things without the bacteria that live in and on your body. All right, if you are really fascinated by this and you want to dig deeper, this is a book I cannot recommend enough to you. It's by a writer called Ed Yong. And Ed Yong um, is a science writer on the staff of Atlantic. He's been in The New Yorker. Wired, The New York Times, Nature. He's an incredible scientist, I mean, an incredible science writer who takes really complicated topics and breaks them down into understandable, beautiful analogies and language. This is a phenomenal book, and it is one of the best $16.99 that you could spend. Um, I had the privilege of meeting Ed at a science teacher's meeting um, earlier this year. And he signed my book, so the title of the book is I Contain Multitudes, and he signed the book To Kneel and All Your Many Multitudes. <laughs> so he signed it for all my bacteria as well. But it is a great book, and we will touch on some of the stories in this book as we move through the next several weeks. Okay, you heard me talk about microbiome, microbiome, microbiome. What is the microbiome? So this is the collection of non-human cells that lives in and on your body. Most of what we're going to talk about are bacteria. And we're going to talk about that because we have the best tools and technologies to classify bacteria. But I want to make sure you realize your microbiome includes way more than bacteria. It includes Archie, Archae, which used to be called Archaebacteria. It includes phages, which are these incredible little viruses that specifically infect and kill bacteria. They look like something from a science fiction movie. Fungi, your, the mycobiome is just the collection of the fungi in and on your body. This interesting category called microbial eukaryotes, 
the eukaryome. We like to name everything in the world of science. Your microbiome includes your mycobiome and your eukaryome and your virome, which are all of the viruses. Most of these non-bacterial pieces, we are just starting to scratch the surface on. And sadly, most of what I'm going to talk about is bacteria. I will try to bring these in where I can, but the data just aren't there yet. So think about the fact that everything I'm telling you, there are multiple other tiny living things on your body that we, aren't even be, that we've, we haven't even scratched the surface on. So your microbiota, that's the collective, all the microbes of all these categories. So your microbiota. The term microbiome originally just meant the genetic information across your microbiota. So microbiome originally meant the DNA inside all these things. We have kind of co-opted that term microbiome to now also refer to the microbiota. So you'll hear me talk about microbiome really as the collective I'm using microbiome, where originally we would have used the term microbiota, so you're probably going to hear me use those terms interchangeably. Okay, week one, the human microbiome and how it forms. We're going to go all the way back to 1684, probably not where you thought we were going to be starting our session tonight, with Anton van Leeuwenhoek, so that's this gentleman right here on the left-hand side of the picture. He was a glassmaker, and he was an incredible, he was a Dutch glassmaker, and he began making grinding glass for this instrument, which was the, one of the earliest microscopes. So there were groups in England that were making microscopes, van Leeuwenhoek was making a microscope. This really looks like a door hinge, doesn't it? It does not look like a microscope, and you would actually hold this, so you would pick this, you would rotate it and pick it up, and you would look on the, through the backside through this tiny little hole right here, and you put your specimen on this little pin, and you would look through on the backside through this glass, and that was really the, it was a, um, an incredibly powerful magnifying glass. It was the first microscope. So in England, they did slightly different types of microscopes that didn't give them the ability to see at the level of the microscope that Leeuwenhoek put together. He ground glass in a way that no one else could. And he wrote about it, and he would pass his writings as he would make observations of what he saw through his microscope. He would pass observations on to his friends in England who couldn't replicate what they saw with their microscopes. And so they thought he was totally making everything up. And then he somehow was willing to give them some of his microscopes, and they suddenly realized that he was not making this up, that his microscopes were seeing things that they had never seen before. He was an amateur scientist, but he had that incredible thing that you love in a scientist. He was curious. He asked all kinds of questions. He looked at everything through his microscope. He looked at pond water through his microscope. He looked at blades of grass. He looked at insects through his microscope. And in 1684, he wrote to one of his friends in England who actually published his writings in the, um, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London. All right, those of you in the back of the room, probably in the front of the room, this is going to be really challenging to read. I'm going to read it to you. Recognize that all of the F's are S's, because that's just the way this writing went. I'm going to start right here. Though my teeth are kept usually very clean, nevertheless, when I view them in a magnifying glass, I find growing between them a little white matter as thick as wetted flour. You and I would know that as plaque. In this substance, though I could not perceive any motion, I judged there might probably be living creatures. Okay, so this guy's like, oh, what is that? Oh, I wonder if there's something living in there. That's a conversation I'm sure you all have every day with people that you, you know, but. 
I therefore took some of this flour and mixed it with either pure rainwater, wherein there were no animals, he'd already looked through, the, through his microscope and knew that there was nothing in the pure rainwater, or else with some of my spittle, so some of my spit, having no air bubbles to cause motion in it. Okay, so not only has he done this, but he's also gone <laughs> <laughs> And then to my great surprise, perceived that the aforema, aforesaid matter contained very many small living animals, which moved themselves very extravagantly. The biggest sort had the shape of an A. Their motion was strong and nimble, and they darted themselves through the water or spittle as a jack or a pike, those are fish, as a jack or a pike does through the water. So, this is the first time that someone looked at their microbiome, 1684. And he was so fascinated with what he saw that he showed everybody. The lady that did the laundry, the person who brought the milk, he would grab them and say, you gotta look at this. This is the stuff from in between my teeth and I spit in it and look and do you see these living things? And he drew them and the way that they moved. So this was the first record of our microbiome by this incredible amateur scientist. The microbiome was kind of forgotten about for a long time. And microbiologists began to study it, but they began to study it really in the context of disease. And in terms of, and then in the public imagination, it became, as I said, things we must destroy. And so in most microbiology textbooks, really until like, you know, not that many years ago, the majority of it was devoted to disease-causing bacteria, and only a tiny amount was devoted to healthy, or at least non-harmful bacteria. That changed, well, let me back up. It didn't change because at the time, the primary way we studied bacteria was by looking at them under the microscope or by culturing them in a Petri dish with agar, which is a little bit like jello that provides the nutrients that bacteria need to grow. And you make different things in the agar, you add different chemicals, different nutrients to grow different bacteria. So the primary way that we learned about our microbiome was by culturing those organisms. Now the challenge with that is I only can define it based on a certain set of classifications. What's its shape? How big is it? Does it grow on this? Does it move or not? What does it look like under the microscope? And somewhere around 5 to 7% of all the bacteria, it's estimated, actually can be cultured. So more than 90% of the bacteria you can't see through this technology. You can't do anything with. So we had to wait until genetic technology advanced to the point where it was feasible to sequence the DNA of bacteria. And that really didn't happen until we got into you know, a little bit in the late 90s, but mostly in the 2000s, and especially after about 2007, 2008, when those new machines came along, those sequencing machines that let us do things rapidly and cheaply and in enormous amounts. So at that point, we began to add these kinds of ways to do tests. And I'm not gonna dig deeply into this, but I just want you to understand, PCR panels, I'm looking at some specific regions of the bacteria. So that's kind of the equivalent of saying, here's a book, I'm going to look at these 10 pages in the center of the book in chapter 15, and I'm going to look at those same 10 pages or that same section of chapter 15 in all the different books and see what, how I compare them. It's a very narrow way to do it, but it was the best that we had. Then we began to look at something called partial genomes. When we talk about DNA barcoding, this is that technology. We're looking at a specific piece of DNA that we know varies greatly from bacteria to bacteria, and it lets us do some broad classification. Oh, I see these bacteria in this population. I see these 15 different varieties of bacteria in this population. The challenge with that is this only lets me get down to a certain level of classification which we'll dig into in just a second. But I can get down to the genus level. So now we're gonna take you all the way back to kingdom, phyla, class, order, family, genus, species. Remember that in, in high school, the way that you remembered that taxonomy was 
the first letter of each of those words was uh, King Philip called out for green salad. Um, you might, or maybe you don't remember that, but anyway. It lets me get down to the genus level, but it doesn't let me get all the way down to the species, so I don't get the level of detail that I really would like. For that, I need to actually sequence the entire genome. That process is called metagenomics. That is much more expensive. That takes up a whole lot more data and a whole lot more time. And so for much of the last six or seven years, this is the world in which much of the microbiome has lived. This right here. Much of what's in this box is built around this. Keeping in mind that there are lots of different tools and technologies and approaches and I can't get all the way down to the level of species that I want. This gives me a much better sense. But sometimes just knowing what's there doesn't tell me anything at all about what it does, what's its function. So for that, I need to go further. I need to look at what genes are being active, what proteins are being made, what small molecules is this bacteria producing that it is sending out into the environment around it. And so for that, I actually need to add in things like metatranscriptomics, metaproteomics, and metabolomics, which gives me a sense of the RNA, which is kind of the temporary messenger that is a copy of the DNA, the protein that it ultimately um, gives instructions to produce, and then these small molecules that are kind of byproducts of how the bacteria lives its life that it shares with the environment around it. So this is still in development, but this is the kind of information that gives us the broadest view, that gives us a sense of what's it actually doing. So yeah, so I know that those bacteria are there, but that doesn't help me get to this level to build a biological plausibility around that. These other pieces help me move down that road. So there are lots of different ways that you can analyze the microbiome from the very narrow, which is low throughput and really inexpensive, but very, very limited, all the way to these broad views, which give me lots of information, but are at a really high cost and give me an enormous amount of data that I have to sort through. All right, so that brought us to about 2012, when a huge number of papers were published around a project, a five-year project called the Human Microbiome Project. So the Human Microbiome Project was big on the scale of like the Human Genome Project. Maybe not that big, but it involved multiple uh, scientists across the world, multiple different places of funding, and they looked at the microbiome of 250 healthy individuals. They looked in their mouth, they looked at the gut, they looked behind their ears, they looked in their nose, they looked in the crease of their elbows and on their palms, on the bottoms of their feet, to try to get a sense of what's there and how much does it vary from person to person. And in many cases, they sampled these individuals at multiple times. If the individuals in this study were women that were pregnant, they were sampled throughout their pregnancy and after they'd given birth. If some of these individuals got sick, they came in and they were sampled while they were sick and after they were treated. So they were looking at, oh, to just get a first glimpse of how the microbiome changes over time. The first set of papers were published in 2012, and that really was what first started capturing the public and science writers' understanding of this new science, this, how genomics could give us a glimpse of what's in the microbiome. 10,000 different species of bacteria were identified in the Human Microbiome Project. 10,000. That was about 9,000 more species than we had known before this project actually came out. Each person had about 1,000 different strains living in and on their body in the places that these were sampled. Okay, I'm going to tell you this, but I'm going to ask you to resist the urge to run and find the antibacterial soap and the wet wipes, okay? Approximately 100 trillion bacteria per person. Now, when we first talked about the Human Microbiome Project five years ago, at that point the research papers had been out for about 18 months, I told you that that 100 trillion bacteria was 10 times the number of cells that were actually human. So there were 10 times as many bacteria in your body as there were human cells. That data actually has been proven wrong. 
it's almost one to one. So there are almost this many cells, human cells, in your body. About 1.3 bacterial cells per human cell. Which is really interesting to think about because if you have ever had a colonoscopy and you know the prep and the vast majority of the bacteria that live in your body are in your gut, when you've finished a colonoscopy, you've totally altered the balance and you've now got more human cells than bacterial cells. So something like that can totally shift that human to bacterial balance. If you, were to, if you were able to take all the bacteria together, you'd have about two and a half pounds by weight. That's about the, the weight of the human brain. And about three pints in terms of volume. A hundred trillion in about three pints. That's pretty incredible. So you are what is often called a super organism. You are not just human. You are bacterial, you are viral, you are fungal. And all of these cells, all these different communities work together to maximize your ability to live and function in this world. They give you more energy. They help your immune system um, learn what, is, what should be left alone and what it should attack. They provide vitamins that you can't get any other way. They help crowd out bad bacteria, kind of like when you overseed your lawn so the weeds don't come up. All of these things happen because of this super organism, this enormous thing that you are. And all of these things that live in and on us actually influence our behavior in ways that we aren't necessarily even aware of. So before we think that we are the supreme being here, lots of what we do actually is potentially controlled by the things that call us home. That's an interesting thing to think about. The other thing that's really valuable to understand is that all this bacteria, all these different species, these thousand different species of bacteria that live on your body, each have their own set of DNA and they have their own set of genes. So there's about eight million different microbial genes or s kinds of microbial genes in your microbiome. Eight million compared to the 20,000 that are present in your cells. So here's an example of that. Humans, your DNA has less than 20 genes that let you break down carbohydrates, that let you break down like eating celery. You don't have a lot of genes that produce enzymes that break down celery. Celery normally just passes right through your body if you didn't have a microbiome. One specific species of bacteria, this one right here, has 260 of these genes that break down carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates. So your bacteria are able to do things that you can't because they have a genetic set of diversity that you and I don't. And the other thing that we'll learn is that they swap this genetic information around all the time. It's like baseball cards. They are trading genetic information back and forth. And we're gonna hear a really cool story next week about how one of those bacterial genes has now taken up residence within our bacteria that live inside our gut. Well, at least if you're from a certain part of the world, it's taken up residence inside your gut. There is a fantastic story from 2012 when the Microbiome Project first released their information called Tending the Body's Microbial Garden. It's by a great writer, Carl Zimmer. Carl Zimmer, along with Ed Yong, are incredible at taking this complicated science. Um, this is well worth finding if you, can, if you can get your hands on it. It does a great job of explaining your bacteria and your microbiome. Last piece before we take our break. So we're going to go to our break in just a second. What was surprising to many scientists is that your microbiome is very personalized. Your microbiome is very different from the person sitting to your left and to your right. So there are, if we were to compare between two individuals, we would find very few bacterial species that are exactly the same. 
So there was this theory that there was something called a core microbiome, which is what everybody had. A healthy microbiome contained the following 600 species of bacteria. And that's not the case at all. There is no one common microbiome, which means we have to start thinking, and I've already alluded to this, we have to start thinking instead of who is there, what bacteria are, what specific strains of bacteria are living there, and we have to think differently in terms of what are they doing? So what's the function that they carry out? Because there might be a hundred different strains of bacteria that all are able to do the exact same thing. And as long as you have one of those strains in your body, you're able to actually do the thing that needs to happen. So we think potentially less in terms of, do I have this set? And more, what's the functional impact of those? That's a very, very different way for us to think about this. And as we start thinking about how can I alter my microbiome, how can I change my microbiome, that's a, we have to think about the function that we need to bring in, not just I want this specific strain. Okay, 716. We're going to take a 15-minute break. Actually, we're going to take a 10-minute break because <laughs> we've got a lot of ground to cover. So I will see you back in 10 minutes. Or I will see you back to next week if you're going to head out to the parking lot. Um, but I'll see you in just a few minutes.
All right, let's talk about how your microbiome forms and how it develops. If you're still out grabbing a cookie or a coffee, that's all right, take your time. Historically, we thought that the, that the womb was microbe free. And in fact, we only dealt with microbial issues um, when there was something wrong. So if there was bacteria present during pregnancy, we were very concerned about what that meant. There's some evidence nowadays that suggests that there might actually be bacteria present in the womb that actually cross through the placenta. That data is real shaky at the moment. Um, it definitely hangs out down here in the association box. But it is possible that regardless of everything else I'm about to tell you, that infants actually come into the world already with a set of bacteria that they got in utero. So stay tuned for where that science goes, what that science tells us. So these are the factors early in life that influence how the microbiome forms, how your microbiome forms. Your, the microbiome of your skin, of your mouth and nose, of your digestive system and your colon. And we'll hit many of these. We won't have time to hit all of these. I can point you to literature if you'd like to dig deeper into this. And again, I just want to remind us, this is a guilt-free zone. So no finger pointing from, from me. I'll also call your attention to the other set of handouts that you got. And those of you watching online, this is at the very back of your set of handouts. And that other set of handouts includes a couple of key things. So it starts with a table that actually shows you some of the key bacteria that are present across the microbiome. Most of these are associated with our gut microbiome. And as you move, these are all bacteria. So this is all in the kingdom bacteria. And then it breaks it out into the different taxonomic subgroups of, of um, phyla, class, order, all the way down. So when you hear us talk through the next several weeks about specific types, this may be something that you want to refer back to to kind of see where it fits. Or maybe not. No worries. There will be no test on this, I promise. And then the second page is kind of a handy reference of a lot of the stuff that we're going to cover. So what do the bacterial data seem to suggest? So if you look first, um, for gestational, well, for the first one, anatomical part of the gut tract, in the colon, and then over here you see across the top, you see the different um, phyla of bacteria, which correspond to these broad categories on your first sheet. And you'll see up arrows or down arrows, which just gives you a sense of are we seeing generally increases, generally decreases, or differences. So this is kind of the handy dandy cheat sheet recognizing that still the data is not nearly as nice and clean as this table makes it look. There's a lot more uh, murkiness in this, but it gives you a place to do some, some comparisons from. All right, let's start by talking about the impact on your non-gut, your microbiome, so your skin microbiome. So one of the key places where this is different is the way that an individual is born. If they are born vaginally through the vaginal tract or if they are born by C-section. Being born through the vaginal tract gives you what is called your bacterial baptism. It is your first exposure to the bacteria that are present in the lining of the womb. And so if you look at newborns that are born vaginally, the microbes on their skin shortly after birth seem to be about half corresponding to bacteria that are present in the vagina and about half corresponding to bacteria that are present on the skin. If you're born by a cesarean section, it depends on what your labor was like before the C-section. So if you had what's called labored C-section, so you went into labor, your water broke, you started through labor, but you were unable to complete, the child was unable to na navigate through the birth canal, and then you had to have a C-section. So that's a labored birth. Then the skin 
because it moved partway into the birth canal, also has that vaginal bacteria on it and skin, the skin, um, skin bacteria from where the mother holds or the father or the caregivers hold the baby. If you are a non-labored C-section, so your water didn't break, you went in for your C-section and your baby was born um, without labor beginning, then you have a less diverse community on your skin that mimics the bacteria that are found on the skin of your mother or your father or hospital caregivers. So it is a less diverse population of bacteria on the skin because you had no contact with the bacteria that are present in the vaginal tract. By six weeks of age, the microbiomes of your skin have formed individual niche communities. So at birth, and in the first few weeks after birth, they, you don't see a whole lot of difference between the bacteria that are in the crook of your elbow and the bacteria that are on your thigh and the bacteria that are behind your ear. But by about six weeks of age, there's a specific set of bacteria that are now thriving and growing in these populations. Some that are dry, some that are damp, the environments that are damp, some that see a lot of light, some that see no light, some that get washed multiple times in a day, some that don't get washed multiple times in a day. So by six weeks old, you've now built these individual environments, these neighborhoods of bacteria in different parts of your body, much like you do as an adult. So it does not take long for your skin to develop these individual communities. Now let's talk about your gut bacteria. The vast majority of the bacteria in your body live in your digestive system. If we were to take your digestive system out, it's got lots of folds and lots of, lots of um, loops in it, and we were able to spread it out, the, the surface area of your, I think it's just your large intestine, would cover a tennis court. Let's say that again. The surface area of your large intestine is equivalent to a tennis court, and every centimeter of that is covered with bacteria. So what populates that? How do you get that? What first seeds that? So if you are born vaginally, you are getting that population from two, maybe three primary places. The vaginal tract, and then also the intestine. Now let me be real careful about how I step into this. But the end of your digestive tract and the end of the birth canal are both in about the same place. <laughs> and the process of birthing means that there is some mixing and mingling between the two communities. And that is absolutely normal because that is how your infant gets their gut microbiome seeded by a combination of bacteria from the vaginal tract and a combination of bacteria from the intestine. That's exactly the way that that is supposed to happen. So squeamishness aside, that's, that's how we get that. Um, there was a really interesting study that was done that I'm not going to dig deeply into, but you can kind of look at the figure that looked at the bacteria that were present in the oral cavity, on the skin, in the vaginal tract, and the gut of mom and then looked at the, the oral and the gut tract of an infant at one day, at three days, and at four months. And you can see how in the first few days of life, the infant is just a mix of all these different bacteria from all these different parts of the body, of the mother's body, and from their caregiver's skin and other places. And then as you move in past the first couple of weeks, some of them really take root in certain parts of the body and just thrive, and others don't survive so well there, but they might survive in other places. So again, this set of communities, this diverse microbiome, really begins to take root relatively early in life. Now, if you're born by a cesarean section, again, it also comes back to was it labored or was it unlabored? Did you have any engagement in the vaginal tract or none at all? And so if, if you had no engagement, if you were completely cesarean, the waters never broke, the gut is colonized by a different set of bacteria. 
And so you actually see differences in the gut microbiome of infants born vaginally and infants that are born by cesarean section. How long does it take for the microbiome to normalize for these kids that are born by cesarean section? Depends on the study that you look at. And again, it's why I'd be really careful down here. Some studies say three weeks. Some studies say seven years before it normalizes. So again, some of that comes back to what are the methods you're using to analyze? Are you looking at what are the specific species that are there? Or are you looking at functionally? Are you getting all the key activities done, even if there are different strains of bacteria doing it in babies that were born one way versus the other? So the key is, are there long-term impacts of being born by cesarean? And there are lots and lots of studies that suggest that the answer for that question is yes. There's a higher incidence of things like eczema, hay fever, asthma, type 1 diabetes. diabetes. <laughs> and allergies from cesarean births. Now, here's the thing that we want to be really careful about. Because it is too easy right now logically to say, oh, their microbiomes are different. Oh, we see these differences later in life. There must be a very clear link between those two. And here's an important point that I want to make sure that we walk away with. There's a huge co-founder with that. And that's that many women that have C-sections are also given IV antibiotics before birth, before they give birth which means those antibiotics move through the maternal system, cross the placenta, and are in the infant. And in some cases, infants are given antibiotics shortly after birth if there are specific infections that you're concerned about. But not all women that have C-sections, but many have IV antibiotics, and that passes to the infant. And as we're going to talk about, what does an antibiotic do? It kills bacteria. So broad spectrum antibiotics potentially wreak havoc on the ability of an infant's microbiome to form. That has nothing to do with whether they were born through the vaginal birth canal or whether they were born by cesarean. It is completely because of the antibiotics that they may have received. So we've got to be really careful that we don't draw these one-to-one -one correlations between those. There are clear differences in the microbiome. And even though those may be relatively short term, they are different. And there may be a longer term impact of that difference. Because some of the data suggests the way the microbiome develops in the gut has a lot to do with what its first colonizers are. And what are the first inhabitants? Because those inhabitants create an environment that is inviting to certain bacteria and not inviting to others. And if we start down a different pathway, we may end up with very different strains later on at the end of the day. So this is an image, an illustration, looking at the different bacterial strains that are present in three different infants. So each one of these graphs is a different infant. The top one was born vaginally, the second one was born by C-section, and the third one was born vaginally. We'll come back to the third one in just a second. Across the Y-axis, so moving from left to right is different months of age. So these infants were followed from birth all the way through almost three months of age. And each of these different colors corresponds to a different phylum, a different broad category of bacteria that are present in their gut. So there's a lot going on in this image. I'm going to focus us just on what's in the red box. And that is that early in life, the first two or three months, at least in these two individuals, vaginal and C-section, there's a difference in the population of bacteria that are present. If you just look at the amount of greens, yellows, reds, purples, and blues, you're going to see differences. Historically, within the last few, maybe the last couple decades, there was this division that there were very clear differences between vaginal births and C-section births. Lots of papers continued to um, 
reinforce that. Recently, different sets of papers actually have given a very conflicting set of images with some studies not finding any difference at all between different individuals born different ways. And some, like this paper, actually find that this individual that was also born vaginally has a pattern that looks more like the C-section than this individual, which was the standard vaginal birth pattern. Now, it just so happens that this particular individual actually had antibiotics early at birth. So that might account for some of this difference. There are clear differences in the patterns between C-section and non-C-section. Exactly the meaning of that is still somewhat up in the air. Especially because by the time we get to 12 months of age, those pattern differences generally disappear. About the time we shift an infant to solid food, and now there's a whole new set of nutrients in the gut that nourish completely different strains of bacteria, at that point, the difference between vaginal birth and C-section almost completely disappears. Now, that doesn't minimize the fact that there is a difference. What we don't know is if that early difference has longer-term implications or not. That requires a lot of this stuff, and we still can't even fully get the right answer here. So there's a very popular approach that many um, young families are now taking based on their knowledge that infants born by C-section have a different microbiome, or at least some of the studies suggest they have a different microbiome. And that practice is called vaginal seeding. And essentially the thinking goes, if we take sterile gauze and we collect some of the bacteria that are present in the vaginal tract, and then we swab it over a newborn born by C-section, I'm essentially replicating their, bapti their bacterial baptism, their journey through the vaginal tract. Did I skip that? There we go. All right. Um, this is an NPR story that came out recently that actually talks about a clinical trial to try to get a sense of if that makes a difference or not. The authors of this paper, Frontiers in Medicine from last year, say, although the data are supportive of a difference in the early life microbiome of infants born via C-section versus vaginal delivery. So there does seem to be a lot of a difference among many of the papers. The evidence, is, the evidence that this is due to the mode of delivery is unconvincing and lacking in critical data, i.e., many of these women that have C-sections also have antibiotics. So we can't necessarily say the difference is because the baby traveled through the birth canal or not. So they actually argue against vaginal seeding for a couple of reasons. You potentially pass harmful bacteria that live in the vaginal tract onto an infant unless you're able to know ahead of time that none of those harmful bacteria are present. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologi Gynecologists recently came out with a position statement that pretty much says the same thing with one important caveat. They say that vaginal seeding should only be done in the context of a well-defined clinical trial where you actually have cases and controls and you're doing this under a strict um, set of research protocols, again, to try to get us some information to know if that thing at the top makes sense or not. So, the jury is definitely out on this, even though this is a very hip new practice that at least in theory makes sense based on what I've told you. There's some logic behind this, but it is a jump from here up to the top, and that's where things get dangerous. But I get it, if I'm a new parent, and I know that I'm gonna have to have a baby by C-section, and I've seen these studies, I'm gonna be looking for something that I can do, anything. We, those of you in the room that are parents, you always are looking for something that you can do, even if it's just to make you feel like you've done something. Okay, now that I've, um, alienated a whole set of moms. <laughs> Let me now alienate a whole other set of moms. And let's talk about 
if infants are breast or formula fed. Let's just wade right in there. And I'm sure that all the folks that are monitoring the online chat um, at this moment are really uh, cursing my name. But let's talk about breast milk. 27% breast milk is full of bacteria, good bacteria. We think that a woman's breast milk is in some way sterile. No, it's full of bacteria. Almost a third of the bacteria in an infant's gut, if that infant is exclusively breastfed, almost a third of the bacteria in their gut came from the bacteria in the breast milk. Ten more percent came from the bacteria that are on the skin around the nipple. So when infants are breastfed, they are getting a whole new set of bacteria that you're not getting in a formula-fed baby. Now, the skin bacteria they're still getting because, you know, babies put everything in their mouth and people's fingers and everything. So they're getting some of that, but they're not getting the bacteria that are present in the breast milk. In addition, there are a whole set of prebiotics in breast milk. Now let's talk about the difference between a probiotic and a prebiotic. A probiotic is a living bacteria. It is some sort of bacteria that you are, so when you eat yogurt that's got live active cultures, that's a probiotic. You are taking live bacteria into your body. A prebiotic is not a living thing. It is not a bacteria. It is some sort of nutrient that bacteria or certain bacteria need to thrive. So it is like the food source to encourage certain bacteria to grow. Bacteria can't live in your gut or on your skin or anywhere else in your body if they don't have the food they need to carry out their function. So prebiotics lay down the food source that allows those bacteria to thrive. Breast milk is full of prebiotics. One story that I read, one paper that I read said that there are 141 different prebiotics in breast milk. These are primarily oligosaccharides. These are repeating units of sugars. They're complex sugars that your body doesn't digest, but the bacteria in your body do. So it is like laying out the red carpet for a certain type of bacteria, many of which are present in breast milk, to thrive on. Now let's compare breast milk to formula. And you can look at the microbiomes of infants that are exclusively breastfed and infants that are formula fed. And here's where it gets really complicated. <coughs> Many studies find that there are differences, that there are more of a specific type of bacteria called bifidobacteria in the microbiome of babies that are breastfed. At the same time, there's a greater diversity of bacteria in the microbiome of babies that are formula fed. There are more different types. Babies that are formula fed have a microbiome that is a little closer to a more adult microbiome. Babies that are breastfed have a microbiome that is a little more immature, that has a smaller number of species and mostly things like bifidobacteria. Is that better? Is that worse? Is that different? Yes, it's different, but what's the impact of that? Some of the studies have said that there's a significant impact and that there's a clear association with health issues with babies that are not breastfed. In addition to everything we just talked about, breast milk also contains um, a whole set of immune factors that help support the growth of the early immune system of a baby. But the actual data vary depending on the study that you're looking at. And they're complicated by the fact that formula makers have gotten really good at figuring out what's in breast milk and then trying to replicate it in formula-fed babies. So the formula now, for example, well, let me show you that in just a second. These differences, are they differences in the composition? So is it just I've got this community versus that community? Or are they differences that have functional meaning. This community provides something that that community doesn't. Again, this is where we get really challenging. 
not everyone is able to breastfeed. And so I don't want this to feel like I'm saying that people that formula feed are putting their kids, are intentionally putting their kids at greater risks down the road. There are choices that we make based on the things that we have in front of us. And it's really challenging to look back and say, well, that was the wrong decision. That's not where I want any of us to go with this conversation. Let me show you this. This is Gerber Good Start. I am not paid by the Gerber company. This is not a product endorsement. Let me be really clear about this. But this formula, if you look at the, at, on the Gerber website, this specific Good Start General HMO powder formula contains two FLHMO, which is a human milk oligosaccharide, which is one of the primary prebiotics that are found in breast milk. So this formula contains a prebiotic. This formula also contains probiotics. It contains live bacteria, and the bacteria that they used are selected to mimic the strains that are found in breast milk. So this formula gets closer to breast milk than formulas maybe of 30 or 40 years ago. As we understand more about what it is that is so complete about breast milk, formula makers try to figure out how to incorporate that in to their formula. This is not in your um, handout because I added this about two hours ago because I thought it was a really valuable quote to kind of ground us in this. The most important gap of knowledge dealing with mode of feeding, breast versus formula, relates to the lack of studies including health outcomes. Things that are further up this chart. Most studies are descriptive and some show correlations, but no cause and effect mechanisms are actually demonstrated. This prompts the need for studies that demonstrate direct cause and effect relationships that link early dietary and microbiome interactions and then go on to look at the short and the long-term impacts on organ development and health. We just don't have a lot of that data. So again, we're stuck unsatisfactorily living down here with this question that is probably one of the most divisive questions that faces new moms. This is a study that you've actually seen from Biotech 101. I just want to put it up here just in a quick glimpse. This is a scientist mom who had a baby boy and brought his diaper, a diaper, a dirty diaper, into work every day into the lab and then analyze the bacteria that were present in the diaper, the poop, which in the feces, sorry I said I wasn't going to use cutesy language, in the feces, and analyze the broad categories, the classes of bacteria that were present, and then color coded them. So you can see we don't have a whole lot of diversity early on. So this is a, a baby that was, that was started on breast milk, move to rice cereal and then formula and table food start and we begin to see more diversity show up. We also see that this baby right in this window, 92 to 100 days, had a fever and got sick, had a bacterial infection and you see the rise of some of those, um, some of those fever causing types of bacteria. Here and here and here there's an antibiotic given and you can see that there's a drop in the diversity of the uh, bacteria that are present after the antibiotic. Again, antibiotics kill bacteria, especially broad spectrum antibiotics. So it just gives you a sense of how the microbiome changes. By the time that we reach about the age of three, our microbiome now looks pretty much like an adult microbiome. So that first year, it is very different. About the time we start table foods, you know, nine months, 12 months, until about 24 months, it begins to look more adult-like. And then by the time we hit three years, it's pretty much mimics the adult microbiome from whatever population, whatever culture that toddler lives in. 
Did you hear that caveat I just gave you? Whatever culture that toddler lives in. And this is because there's now a whole new set of nutrients in the, in the digestive system. And so if there's a whole lot of plant matter, a whole lot of fruits and vegetables, then the bacteria that break down those complex carbohydrates are going to have a heyday. If there's a whole lot of fat and protein in the diet, then a different set of bacteria are going to find food at the buffet table, and others are not going to have so much to work from. I think one of the best examples of this is a study that looked at the transition and the gut microbiome of kids that were born in Italy and kids that were born in Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is here on the western side of Africa, just in geographic difference. These two cultures have very different food populations. Burkina Faso is low in fat and animal protein and is very high in vegetables. The Italian diet is a traditional Western diet. We'll dig more into diet types next week, but it is generally high in fat and animal protein and sugar and starch and low in fiber. Both populations had similar gut microbiomes while they were breastfed, but then after they were transitioned to solid food, this is what their microbiome looked like. Now you're gonna notice this is like 14 and 15 kids. This is a small percentage of kids, so that's a really important caveat to look at. But the pie charts, the different colors, represent broad categories of bacteria, different phyla of bacteria, those early things on the left-hand side of that colored table that we handed out. You can see right at a glance, even if you're in the back of the room, there are big differences in the gut bacteria of the kids on the Western diet and the toddlers that are on the heavily plant-based diet. And that's because these two different populations are putting different nutrients in their gut that are allowing different bacteria to thrive. So our three and four-year-olds around the world, their gut microbiome matches that of the people, the adults in their household that are eating the same kind of foods that they are. But all three-year-olds around the, around the world, when they start table food, don't have the same set of microbiome. It is very dependent on the diet, on the kind of food that you're putting in your mouth. All right, we're near our end. Let me do one more piece. Antibiotic use. We're gonna hit this more heavily in week four, but let me give you a preview of this. This is a study looking at um, each one of these rows is a different individual, a different child and they're being analyzed from birth all the way out to three years. Each dot or triangle is a different time point when their gut microbes were sampled. And the difference between the circle is it was a more narrow type of testing. The triangle was a broad test, so you got lots more information, but it, again, it's more expensive. So you see there were lots of different tests that were run across these three-year windows. Lots of opportunities to sample the microbiome. This group of kids never had any antibiotics first three years. This group of kids, every color dot was an antibiotic course that they were on. Yeah, yeah. It ran between nine and 15 antibiotics over their first three years. That tends towards the high side of antibiotic usage in Western nations. But it is not uncommon for three-year-olds to have had four to seven rounds of antibiotics over their life. And the different colors correspond to the different types of antibiotics. And so you can see for each of these, the bar chart shows you how much of what kind of antibiotic they had. And some of these even had antibiotics at birth. So what's the impact of that? So the microbiota of antibiotic-treated children was less diverse. There were fewer different types of bacteria, fewer species within any one subgroup of bacteria. So in many cases where the kids without antibiotics for a certain type of bacteria may have had five or six different species of that same category, these kids with antibiotics may have only had one or two. The way their microbiomes differed depended on the specific type of antibiotic and the frequency of those types of antibiotics. So early antibiotic use 
clearly impacts the microbiome. But I don't want you to walk out of here saying we should never be doing antibiotics and don't look at your children or your neighbor's children and tell them that, they need to, that if their kid's on an antibiotic, they need to stop that immediately and start force feeding probiotics. There are times when antibiotics save kids' lives. And I think appropriate use of those antibiotics is necessary and valuable. And we still don't yet have a good sense of the long-term impact of antibiotic use. But there clearly are impacts on the developing microbiome. The two things you're going to hear us talk about a lot over the next four weeks, and I promise, starting next week, I'm going to give you more time for questions. I'm going to give you time for questions. I gave you no time for questions today, and I apologize. But I needed to get a lot of foundational content in. But the two things you're going to hear me talk about is that when we become adults, so those of you in this room, most of you or that hear me that are adults, your microbiome is very stable. It does not change very much. So the variation happens when you're young and then becomes relatively stable throughout your life. It may have some variation within it, and there may even be a lot of little variation happening very quickly as different nutrients move through your gut. But in general, your microbiome is relatively stable. That is both good because it means it's hard to disturb it and bad because it means if it does get disturbed, if it reaches, if it falls out of equilibrium, it can be really hard to shift it back into equilibrium. Just eating yogurt is not necessarily going to make that long-term shift. That's one of the frustrating pieces about a lot of our probiotic studies. Most of the probiotics that we eat just wave at our gut microbiome as they pass through our system. <laughs> so how do you try to long-term make stable changes? All right, so next week we're going to talk more about the gut. We're going to talk about the impact of different types of diet on the gut, the relationship between different microbiomes in the gut and obesity and type 2 diabetes and inflammatory diseases like IBS and um, celiac and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. So I'm going to be up here if you've got questions. Kelly East, our genetic counselor, is going to be up here if you've got questions. Have a great night. Thank you for joining us tonight, and I will see you next week.